Okay, so this month we are looking at using strong types to represent values in your problem domain. So, in your problem domain, you often encounter terms, ideas, concepts that come into your programming. They first appear as the names of things in your programs, names of files, names of identif names of variables, names of classes, names of functions, and so on. And those names are a good way to communicate meaning in your programs to other developers so that when they see something in your code, they know what its semantics are just by looking at its name. However, the next thing you're going to encounter is values from your problem domain and you might think, oh, I need to store a telephone number. I'll just use a string. Uh, telephone numbers come in all different sizes and formats, so I can't rely on like an integer type because I might need more digits that can be stored in an int. It might be an international phone number with 12 digits, and my ints might only hold 8 or what have you. So you say, great, I'll just use a string. And that's certainly expedient and a good way to start out. But the problem is that you can do things to a string that don't make any sense for a telephone number. So I've got an example here where I've got a function called get telephone that returns a phone number. And then because it's a stood string, it's perfectly allowable for me to sort the characters in the telephone number, even though that doesn't make any sense. The compiler is not preventing me from doing it. There's no warning. There's no error. But the end result is that I've corrupted my telephone number into a meaningless bag of characters now. So clearly, while using a std string to store a telephone number is expedient, there are many more operations that apply to std string that don't make any sense for telephone numbers. So if we could get the compiler to help us out, by modeling what it means for something to be a telephone number or some other value from our problem domain, if we can model that directly, then when we try to do something silly, the compiler will give us an error and we won't be accidentally doing things with telephone, telephone numbers or whatever other values that are in our problem domain that don't make any sense. So, let's take a look at an example domain value that you <coughs> excuse me that you might be familiar with if you've ever done any x86 assembly language programming so in assembly language you do operations in registers and the result of those operations set flags that tell you something about the operation that you just did so there's a flags register which is a collection of bits and there's a bit that indicates whether the last operation did a carry or whether the last operation resulted in a value that was zero or a value that was negative. And there's other bits in here that tell you things about the state of the processor, whether or not a trap was encountered. Um, and then there's bits down here that have to do with advanced uh, virtual memory status on the processor. So say we wanted to implement something that modeled this flags register. Well, the first thing you might think of, uh, this is just a little CMake list to drive the structure of this, uh, these examples. I've got single source files making up three executables. And my first two examples are going to use C++20. And then my third example uses C++17. So, if we're going to model this CPU flags, we might do that with a, a, kind of the simplest value type that you can have that's going to have any kind of compiler constraints imposed upon it is a enum class. Now, enum class is different from plain enum that you don't get implicit conversions to and from integers. And that's important because we don't want to pass the CPU flags around and have it accidentally get used as an integer someplace where we didn't w intend for that to happen. We don't want 
conversions to the so-called primitive type in the in the C++ standard it's called the underlying type of an enum you don't want those implicit conversions to happen so <clears throat> that's why an enum class is preferable for these sorts of things over a plain enum or macros where you've got at least you've got symbolic names for these different flags within this uh, flags register but by using an enum class if we accidentally use this someplace where we are expecting an integer or we accidentally use an integer in place of something that was expecting a, C a CPU flags those will both be flagged as an error unless we have some kind of explicit conversion so I've um, called this CPU flags and an enum class also provides a scope for all the names of the enumerations within the enum so I don't need to give these all a unique prefix because they're all scoped with inside CPU flags um, now with an enum class you can optionally specify the underlying integral type that is used to store a value of the enumeration now in our case I'm modeling this R flags register which is a 64-bit register you'll see down here that most of the bits are reserved and not used bits 22 through 63 but it is a 64-bit quantity so I'm gonna use uh, it's also in on these these things when they're like combinations of bits that are ORed together they're usually not considered to be a signed quantity it's considered to be unsigned because you know the last bit 63 here might be used for something so I've chosen uint 64t which comes from C standard int uh, in name I've chosen the uh, C++ version that's in namespace standard so that's my underlying type if I don't specify the underlying type for an enum class then I get int whatever size int is by your implementation and int could be 32 bits or it could be 64 bits since we're modeling s explicitly a 64-bit quantity I'm not going to rely on the default size of int I'm gonna make sure that my underlying type is an unsigned 64-bit integer so I've just given names to all these individual bits that are that are called out in that documentation you notice that there's some of the bits are skipped they have some reserved bits in here that are in between some of these values so that's why this is uh, an unsigned one left shifted by zero bits because that's in the zeroth bit position and then this is in the second bit position the fourth bit position and so on so that gives me nice names for these flags now the next thing that I want to do is because it's a combination of flags I probably want to be able to or these things together well in C++ I can do that by writing an operator or it takes the left hand side and the right hand side of the operator I'm writing this as a free function that takes two arguments because I can't write member functions on an enum class if I if I wrote a full class I could write member functions on a class but since this is an enum class I have to make this a global function with two arguments and all I'm gonna do is take the underlying uh, or take the enum cast it to the underlying integral type do the bitwise math operation and then cast it back to our domain type so that this thing the operator or it takes two values from our domain and returns a value from our domain and I could do the same thing with operator and it's identical except for the operator that I'm invoking if I want to do uh, or equals then the first argument the left hand side I have to take by reference because I'm going to modify the left hand side and then I'm going to return a reference to the left hand side so that's why this operator or equals returns a CPU flags reference instead of just a CPU flags same for operator and equals uh, I'm gonna collapse this a little bit for the moment 
Um, similarly, I can write a stream insertion operator for my CPU flags value. And if I run all of this, you see that I've got, oops, I am running the wrong executable. Let's run the first one. Uh, there we go. Start project. Run this again. Build it. Okay. So I took this integral value hex 2000 and I, I cast it to CPU flags. If we look back at our documentation, we'll see that 2000 is down here um, in this IO privilege level chunk, which you notice has two bits assigned to it because it's a small integer, a small unsigned integer packed into a bit field of this flags register. So when I output this one, I get from my stream insertion, or my stream insertion operator says it's IO privilege level with a value of two. The level is two. And for these um, other combinations, they're coming from, he, from here where I'm doing, you know, combining using normal operator notation, values of flags together, and then I can or in another flag onto that value and I print it out so it should have sign, trap, and parity in the output, and that's what we see in the output. I can or in another flag and print it out and now it's got zero in there as well and I'm printing them out in the same order as the documentation here so parity and then zero and then sign and trap Uh, is there a question? How about now? I, I reshared it, but sorry, we're having technical difficulties here. Everything is getting recorded and will be uploaded onto YouTube, but um, it does say it's sharing my screen, so. it's It must be just network latency and Jitsi, you know, filling it in when it can. Uh, I apologize for that, but like I said, it will be uploaded on YouTube in case you want to go back and see something that didn't come across while you were streaming it. Um, but the point is, we can manipulate these flags in a way that's natural uh, to us because it's bit fields that we want to combine. We can use uh, operator and equals on them as well. So, now, to output that Output, to output this stuff, you know, this is nice human readable output. What I could do is I could just output the underlying unsigned 64-bit integer as a hex value and let you figure out which bits are set or not. I don't find that particularly useful myself. So I wrote my own stream insertion operator. And I wrote a little helper function here that just lets me format the output nicely where I just check to see if if a particular bit is set in the flags and if we are not the first bit then I'll put a spacebar space out first and then this bit is set so I'll output the label for the bit and then I'll make a note that we are no longer the first value to be output so that the subsequent values will have the spacebar space output before the label and we'll do that for the parity, the aux carry, and so on. I use a little macro here to get rid of some boilerplate repetition. And then this um, 
this one value with the the I/O privilege level is special because it's multiple bits representing representing an integer and not just one flag. So I've got little special case for that, and then the remaining bits. And if for some reason, after all of that, we didn't output anything at all, it means none of the bits were set, and we don't want, still want to output something, so we will output a zero in that case. So that's kind of fancy. Um, if this is a domain type that you're encountering often, you know you may find it worth it to write you know a fancy stream insertion operator so that you get useful decoded output if you if you don't care that much you can of course just output the underlying unsigned integer value so that's pretty good but if I end up uh, introducing more value types from my problem domain into my code you can already see I, I had to write you know I'd write four operator functions, a little helper function, and a stream insertion operator to get the support that I wanted. So it's not so bad. I didn't have to write all the operators. Um, one thing you notice that I didn't write is I didn't write any comparison operators because for enum class, that's already taken care of by the compiler. I don't need to write a comparison operator myself, which is handy. Um, but I may need to write such comparison operators if my underlying type has some kind of additional semantics that's not the same as what the supply compiler supplied operator equals. Uh, you know, it, like I might need to make sure that if I'm doing an operator equals, I might need to do something like validate that the reserve bits weren't used or something. Depends on your problem domain. So let's take a look at another example here where this time, this is our phone number example from our little description in our meetup description or our example in our meetup description. And so here we're going to construct a, a phone number from a string and we can't really do that with an enum class. So I've, I've written my own class that's going to encapsulate the concept of this phone number value uh, we can construct one from a string and we can get a reference a const reference to the underlying value so we're tr in in this simple model I'm treating a phone number as an immutable thing if you want to modify the phone number you have to completely replace the whole value you can't modify a piece of it so that's one difference from plain old strings my a stream insertion operator is just going to output the underlying value and my comparison operators my uh, so operator equal operator less operator greater they're just going to use the underlying value for their comparisons and here I'm doing a trick where I define not equals in terms of equals and less than or greater in terms of less and equals and I define greater as the opposite of less and greater equal as greater or equal so really the only one of these um, or the only two of these rather that need to access the underlying value is this operator equal and this operator less and then every all the other operators are expressed as relationships from those two functions and using this I can you know model a phone number fairly straightforward if we run this example it got a phone number that it constructed from one of the input arguments in my debug configuration I've got that set as a argument go over here to debugging the command arguments here's my input argument to the program and that is the value that was printed out from constructing a phone number from a command line argument and then I'm comparing a couple phone numbers that I've constructed here and it correctly said that this 555 
is before 867. They're both in 801. So again, pretty straightforward, easy to do, but you know, the more value types you try and model, the more this boilerplate gets really annoying to have to keep writing. So surely there's some kind of library mechanism we can use to simplify our lives so that we can declare these types and the um, appropriate operations that can be performed on the underlying value that are relevant for our problem domain? And the answer is yes, we can do that. So there's a library here. Uh, let's get back over here. So there's a library called strong type def. And the idea here is that you declare a strong type def that has an underlying value type and this um, template parameter pack specifies a, a set of properties that are uh, describing the appropriate operations for our problem domain based on the underlying value type. There's also this tag argument and the reason for the tag is because it, it's very often the case that you'll have two different strong types from your problem domain but they have the same underlying representation and you want the compiler to consider those two types to be different. Now this is certainly the case if you use enum class. Two different enum classes, even though they're both have the same underlying storage representation like int or unsigned integer or what have you, even though they have the same storage representation, every enum class is a distinct type. So you're never going to have a problem of the compiler letting you accidentally compare two values of two different enum classes. And we want the same thing for strong types that we get from this library. So if um, we didn't have the tag, then it's possible that this strong type def, these two strong type defs that are both using an int for storage would be uh, interchangeable by the compiler and we don't want that. So this tag is used to distinguish different types. It doesn't have to be uh, what in C++ they call a complete type, which is you just have to name the tag. You don't have to provide a definition for it. So you don't have to have somewhere have this thing be saying struct first tag, open brace, close curly brace. You just have to give it a name. And um, although in the, his example here, he shows the tag introduced with the struct syntax inline, uh, best practice is actually to declare the struct, the name of the struct, the tag struct separately, and then use that name as the argument to strong type def. So once you've done that using this uh, library, that you might say, what well, what are the properties that I can specify for my types? And if we go down to the end here, here's the list of strong type def properties. These are names within this namespace. And each of these names declares a little class that has the implementation for the appropriate operators. So he's basically, you can, I'll let you uh, browse the table uh, at your leisure, but basically different names are assigned to different uh, capabilities. So just because something is represented as an integer doesn't mean we that all of the operations for integers are valid operations for our domain type. So for instance, um, you may want them to be incrementable because these uh, values from your problem domain rep might represent indices that you're going to increment over because you're going to loop over those indices. So incrementing and decrementing might be values that are appropriate, but multiplication doesn't make any sense. So he's broken down the different operators uh, into some fine-grained properties like pre-incrementable means that it, it supports pre-increment but not post-increment. If you want 
both of those you can specify both pre-incrementable and post-incrementable and then you can get either form of increment operator um, and then farther down you'll see something like subtractable combines self subtractable and mixed subtractable where mixed subtractable means you could subtract an integral value of some other type given here by this t and self subtractable means you can take two objects of your domain type and subtract them against each other so pretty much he's got um, properties here for all the different combinations of things that you might want to do and you might say like hey this list looks pretty long compared to the set of operators I'm used to thinking about and that's because some of these specify properties where you've got binary operators and one of the arguments to the binary operator is your type from your problem domain and the other argument to the binary operator is a different type so if it makes sense to add values from your problem domain and you're using an uh, integral type as the underlying storage it probably also makes sense to let you add plain integers to your values from your problem domain other if if that wasn't allowed this um, let's see he he will have it up here as mixed addable for the case that we're talking about if you didn't allow mixed addable then if you wanted to add an integer you'd first have to construct a domain value from the integer and then add the two domain values together so it's just kind of a syntactic uh, shorthand to have keep you from having to always convert these integers into the domain values explicitly now you may want that because maybe it's rare for you to add naked integers to your domain value type in which case you may not want to allow a mixed addable of int and and in <clears throat> in that scenario as a developer you'd have to explicitly convert this naked integer to the domain type in order to add them together and that can be good because it means when you're looking at your code you see that oh uh, here's the rare case where I needed to add this raw integer and that's why I need the explicit conversion so the explicit conversion makes the rare case stand out um, whereas if you're doing it all the time then it just becomes additional burden on having to use the having to always type these or, or do the type conversion in order to use these domain specific types so you can allow it with mixed addable but giving you this uh, freedom to specify the appropriate properties for your type lets you narrow it to as few operations as are necessary or broaden it to a wide uh, range of operations while still getting the compiler alerting you if you accidentally used one of your domain types where a plain int was expected or vice versa so you can still get the advantage of the compiler alerting you to misuse of values when the signatures don't match but you can still get expressive uh, freedom by combining these properties as needed now uh, we don't need to go over all of these different property specifications for all the the, the normal C++ unary and, and binary operators they're pr pretty straightforward from the name but there are a couple in here that are worth taking a look at so one of the properties that he supports is hashable and this is so that your domain types can participate in hashing with stood hash so that they can be used in con as keys in containers or in values in containers where the containers require the keys or values to be hashable um, another one that is good is streamable where it basically did what I it does for you what I was showing you earlier where you just insert into the stream the underlying value from the domain type um, and then these uh, incrementable this is what I was saying it combines pre incrementable and post incrementable and comparable combines ordered and equality comparable where the ordered 
just does the relations uh, and not pure equality. So down here, equality comparable gets you equals and not equals. So let's take a look at what it looks like to use this library. So over here, I've got my phone number example again. So I've declared my tag and I've created a strong type def for my phone number using the tag. The underlying storage type is standard string. I'm allowing these phone numbers to be compared and I'm allowing them to be streamed. And otherwise my code is just the same as it was before. Here's where I'm doing my comparisons and here's where I'm doing my stream insertion and if we set this as our startup project and run this example it's the same output as before however here it got really easy to introduce these new domain specific types I didn't need to write all that boilerplate for the comparison operators I didn't need to write the boilerplate for the stream insertion and um, <clears throat> all I needed to do was in a declarative fashion say what kind of operations are relevant for this domain specific type now I mentioned that in my build here I had used C++ 20 on these first two examples and used C++ 17 on this third example and that's because this library that we're looking at here is a it is a C++ 17 class template library. It requires some variadic template support that is present in C++ 17 and it uses one feature from the standard library that is uh, deprecated in C++ 17 and removed in C++ 20. Um, this project is on GitHub. There's I, this is my own fork but the the originating project has a open issue to get it to be uh, usable in a C++ 20 environment. Um, I don't think that's going to be particularly hard for him to implement. So that will probably appear fairly soon. Uh, but it just if you're uh, restricted to C++ 14 or C++ 11, I just want you to be aware that this library it does require C++ 17. I did try to compile it under C++ 14 and it was not happy at all. So it definitely needs some of the variadic template support from C++ 17. Now, suppose that for your own domain type, you have maybe a, a set of values or a set of different uh, value types and they all have some property in common but it is not a property that is provided by this library directly. So can you extend the set of properties that you pass in on the declaration to include your own property so you can get custom behavior? Maybe you need to have it interoperate with your database system to be able to write the values into database records fairly common operation but this library can't anticipate all of the database APIs out there in the world so you might want to write your own property class so that you can say these values are um, persistable for instance and use your database API to write the underlying value whether it's int or string or what have you into the database or read it back out of a database so how would you do that well first before we dive into what you would need to do, let's take a look at how this stuff is implemented under the covers. So if we look at this implementation of strong type def, and I'm not going to expect you to be uh, you know, kind of template metaprogramming wizards here. I'm going to explain what we're seeing here as we go on. So this is a template class as we discussed. The first type that comes is a tag and the tag except for being passed along 
is not used anywhere else. It's just used to give the fully instantiated type for the same for, for different tags to give them different types according to the compiler. So just by having distinct struct arguments in this first argument, they're all going to be distinct types, even though the second type argument, which is the underlying value type, could be the same. So it's taking a template parameter pack argument called properties, which you can just think of it as a, a var args variable argument list of types passed into this template. So this template requires at least three parameters, um, but it can have an arbitrary number beyond three. And the first thing he does is derive from this mix-in thing uh, where he's passing in the, the type we're declaring as the first argument to the mix-in and he's passing in the value type as the second argument to the mix-in and each one of these will become a base class and we will do template parameter pack expansion so boiling that all down what he's doing is for each of the properties that is passed in we're going to end up deriving from a mix-in class for each property and the full type we're declaring will be passed into the mix-in and the value type will be passed into the mix-in as well so you might be thinking I don't know what a mix-in is and that's okay because uh, if we go and look at Wikipedia here so they're saying in object-oriented programming languages, a mix-in is a class that contains methods for use by other classes without having to be the parent class of those other classes. So what is that trying to say? In C++, we have two kinds of inheritance that we use. The first kind of inheritance is what you think of as a normal class hierarchy where we've got virtual methods and we use inheritance to have derived classes override the virtual methods from the base class. And that's so we can get runtime polymorphism. You have a pointer to a base class, you call a method through the pointer to the base, it ends up calling the method on the derived class that overrode the base method. Runtime polymorphism. Pretty straightforward. So that's polymorphic inheritance. The other kind of inheritance we have in a class hierarchy is so-called implementation inheritance. So, thinking about implementation inheritance, if we go back to this definition of a mix-in, a mix-in is a class that contains methods for use by other classes. So, what he's doing with his mix-in is each one of these properties that we name is going to result in a mix-in that will add the appropriate methods to this class that correspond to the property. So if it's the pre-increment property, then the mix-in for the pre-increment property adds the pre-increment operator to our class. And by expanding this parameter pack for all of the named properties, we get all of the mix-ins as base classes of our strong type def. So that's why the full definition of strong type def here doesn't contain any of those operator functions. It only contains the stuff relating to this underlying value, which is uh, a facility provided explicitly by strong type def. It's not got nothing to do with unary or binary operators in the C++ language. So if we keep scrolling down here, we'll see that in this strong type def properties namespace, here's the mix in for equality comparable. Inside here, it has the operator equal and the operator not equal. So when we declare our domain type to be equality comparable the this struct ends up being a base class of our domain type and that's how we get access to the uh, 
operator equal equal and you notice here that he's using the full name of the derived class that was passed in as a template argument so that he can say what I really want to do is compare the underlying values of the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Uh, he's got an exception specification here that's basically saying if I can compare the if, if the if the underlying values can be compared and the comparison will not result in a, an exception then my mix-in will not result in an exception. A uh, question in the chat is is the mix-in similar to the decorator design pattern? It, it's similar in that it uses template mechanisms. Um, we'd have to go look at a specific uh, implementation of Decorator in C++. I don't, I don't think of them as the same pattern, but they use similar mechanisms to achieve their goal, if that helps. Um, so again, if we just look at each of these little mix-in classes, they're providing just the one thing associated with their property. So if we wanted to write our own property, he describes that down here. So he describes the built-in behavior properties that he provides. And then, he, and then he has a section on how to write a new one. Basically, you write your own struct that has the name of the property that you're interested in defining. Say it's persistible. If we're going to do something to write our code into a, a database. And if we go back and look over here, you notice that here's the struct that had the name of the property. And within it, was a template struct called mixin. So all of these had a struct called mixin as a, a type inside. And that's uh, required because if we go back to remind ourselves of this declaration up here saying strong type def derives from this is the name of our property class. And within it, it has declared a an additional template class called mixin. So the fact that this is a nested template requires that we have the template keyword here. This is the next nested mixin that we're going to derive from. And that mixin nested template takes two arguments, the derived class that we're declaring and the value type. So takes the derived type and the value type it has to be called mixin and whatever operations we want to perform or provide as member functions of our domain specific type go inside the declaration of this mixin struct inside that's nested in this sorry it's <laughs> it's hard to say with all the verbiage it is the nested template class mixin inside the struct that names the property that the mixin provides. So if we wanted to provide a persist operator, it would be declared as a member function of this mixin. And as a member function of mixin, it has access to the derived type and the underlying value type. So I think most of the time, these canned properties are going to be all that you need. But it's nice to know that if for some reason you need to extend it to specific operations, I think probably the most common one would be you know, serializing and deserializing, whether it's to some kind of uh, database or maybe to you know a network packet via protobuf or something like that. Uh, protobuf is a scheme for network messages that results in a fairly dense and compact representation. It's from Google. And it has a set of API functions for serializing data into a protobuf message and deserializing a protobuf message into a data structure. So obviously that's something not directly provided by this library, but we can write our own property definition to handle that. And 
this looks kind of intimidating at first, but it's really not. It's not necessary to understand um, too much template mumbo jumbo here. Probably this part is probably the most complicated thing going on in this implementation. The rest of it is straightforward member functions. And even these little um, down here in these property definitions, probably the part that's the most complicated is when he's trying to specify whether or not the underlying operation could throw an exception. So that's the no accept clauses in here that are probably the most uh, you know, opaque to somebody that's not familiar with writing this stuff. But I think this is a, a pretty good library. Now this is not the only library that exists out there for writing domain specific types and eliminating the boilerplate. Uh, I just happened to see a presentation on this one and I liked this idea of the properties of the value, the properties that are, are appropriate for our domain specific values being supplied in of our args parameter list because I think it gives us, you know, really, if we go back to here to our phone book example or a phone number example, to me, I just think when I read that, I'm like, oh, it's a strong type for phone numbers. The underlying type is stood string. I can compare these things and I can stream them. So in three lines, I was able to specify uh, just what I want to be able to do with these types and nothing more. I can't, there's nothing else I can do with them without the compiler flagging it as an error. If I need to, I can always get at the underlying value and do something with it. If I just compile this just to prove to you that it does work. So if for some reason I've got to get at the underlying value and a good example of why you might need to do that is suppose you say, hey, I really like this strong type idea and I want to start using it for all my new code, but I have a large body of old code that deals with everything as ints and std strings. So at the boundaries, I need to get the underlying value and pass it into the legacy code. When it comes back out, I can construct my domain specific type directly from the value that came back out of the legacy code. So in all my new features, I can use strong types and get all the benefits there, but I'm not forcing the entire code base of thousands, maybe millions of lines to have to switch over to the new type. I can do that switch over one function at a time as I'm modifying it. If it's not broke, don't fix it. So I can marshal my way in and out of legacy code by using the underlying value member function or by constructing domain type values from uh, the pr so-called primitive types that are being handed back to me from legacy code. So um, as I said, there's other libraries out there. If, you, if for whatever reason you don't like this one, like for instance, the C++17 requirement is a deal breaker. There are other libraries out there. Recent uh, CPPCon videos on this subject have been posted to YouTube that describes some of the other alternatives. Um, this particular library was described in a lightning talk, so it doesn't take long to understand these libraries that are supporting this because they're really quite simple. The, the main purpose of these libraries is to eliminate having to write all this boilerplate. For instance, this stuff. I don't want to keep, you know, writing this stuff every time I want to introduce a new value type in my code. And we didn't mention it explicitly, but you know, sometimes people might say, oh, why don't you just say using uh, you know, phone number two equals std string. Why don't you just do that? Now you can just, now you can just use this everywhere. And while that gives you a name that you can use in your code that helps reveal your intentions, it expo it is, we're back to exposing all of the operations on the underlying type that you that don't apply. So you can still do all the same dangerous things. This is just a synonym for std string. Now it's better than nothing because when you see a function that takes five std strings, 
which one is the customer name, which one is the address, and which one is the phone number, and which one, and, and what are the other two? I said there were five stud strings, so the, I, those, I know it takes those three, I can't remember what the other two are. So using synonyms at least gets you some understanding of looking at this big list of arguments that are all the same type and you can't remember which is which. However, if we use strong types, then I can't mix up the address with the phone number even though they're both stored as the underlying representation in a std string because a strong type is going to prevent me from typing them in the wrong order and accidentally passing in the phone number as the address and the address as the phone number. So strong type defs give you that advantage and that's why this terminology of a strong type def has come about in C++ because for many years people were using regular type defs and there's our weak type defs. They don't enforce the semantics. Uh, in the chat says I'm still hoping for a language level strong type def but I've seen several talks where the presenters said that Bjorn isn't in favor of it. I think we don't need it in the language in, in the sense of um, intrinsic support from the compiler. I think there is plenty of evidence that library solutions can solve the problem. Uh, for this particular library, uh, I proposed to the author that we work together to make it a standards proposal and get it in the standard library. I think this one compared to others that I've seen uh, fits well with the philosophy of the standard library. You don't get operators you didn't ask for. You don't pay for what you didn't use. Um, it is a zero overhead abstraction in the sense that it is a pure header library. There's no compilation library that you have to link against. And even though this looks fairly complicated, all of these th functions are extremely simple and will be inlined by the compiler so it's it results in an abstraction that you don't pay for what you're not using so there's there should be beyond the you know whatever the com the complex runtime complexity is of the underlying types you shouldn't have to pay anything more than that it it should all boil away in compilation and result in code that is just as efficient as using the primitive types of like int or unsigned long or std string or what have you. So um, the author of this library hasn't responded to my open issue where I was suggesting that, but this library is small enough, straightforward enough, and again follows those the same design principles of other elements of the standard library that I don't think it would be hard to write a proposal to get this into the standard library. Um, the other advantage of doing that, writing a proposal, means that the authors of competing implementations of strong type def style domain value type libraries might bring something to the table that isn't immediately obvious just from looking at this one. Maybe their implementation has some advantage in particular cases over this one that we are unaware of, but if we get a proposal going then we can have discussion going around it. So I think it's suitable for the standard library, but I don't think it needs to go down into the, the core language itself. On the chat, uh, Matt is saying we use a very similar one at work and it works great. Once I've convinced everyone there is no runtime overhead, but since there is more code, some seem to think that there's more runtime overhead. I've used Compiler Explorer to show otherwise, but I'm still getting pushback. I think that's fairly common among C++ developers that there's a uh, natural tendency to think that more tokens equals more runtime cost. And template libraries definitely have more tokens. And I think it just takes a little bit of measurement and Compiler Explorer is a great way to show that because it can show the resulting assembly code so you can verify that it doesn't result in additional runtime overhead. Um, there's also something that I uh, refer to as optimized for your brain first and the CPU second. And what I mean by that is you want to use things in your language and in your libraries that make you as productive as possible when you are trying to write code. And 
strong type defs make you more productive because they prevent you from making mistakes and having those mistakes live on in the code for a long time and not getting discovered until you ship it to a customer and it crashes. So we're going to discover misuse of values from our problem domain immediately because the code will not compile. So the shorter the time is between you making the mistake and you finding the mistake, the more productive you are. So that's what I mean by optimizing for your brain first and the CPU second. Once you've got the code correct, then we can run performance profiling on it and find out where the hotspots are and we can improve the performance while keeping the correctness. But uh, I find most of the time that we make simple mistakes early and the difficult debug session becomes because we didn't find the mistake early. We find the mistake much later. So shortening the time between making the mistake and finding it is the one of the ways that I believe is the best way to improve your, your productivity and your performance because we're going to spend less time on crazy debug sessions and we're going to have more time available to do profiling and optimization and so we're going to get code that's correct and fast. Fast and wrong doesn't help anybody. So with that little bit of sermonizing at the end there, uh, if we have any final questions, we're about ready to wrap up. Yeah, I. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Uh, there's a. Uh, comment in the chat that's asking if I stated did you say C doesn't help anybody and uh, so I've been programming in C++ now for a quite a long time probably the last time that I wrote C for a living was ooh, the early 90s and occasionally I have to dip back into some uh, C only code that's not C++ and every time I dip into it I feel like my legs have been cut out from underneath of me and my hands have been chopped off I feel so crippled in that all the facilities that I use to keep myself productive and it and uh, working at a, uh, a high rate are, are missing when I go back to plain C code and it just reminds me that it's not that you can't achieve the same level of quality or correctness in C it requires a lot more personal discipline to achieve the same level of quality and uh, correctness. So you can get there, but man, you just have to be really paying really close attention to every single thing that you write. It's not to say that you can be writing C++ code. You don't need to think at all. That's, that's not what I'm getting at. In C++, we, we make mistakes at the same rate. It's just that we have these facilities to catch the mistakes early. The compiler does more type checking, uh, strong signatures are enforced, uh, we've got mechanisms like strong type def to allow us to encapsulate our concepts with uh, very little runtime overhead or maybe no runtime overhead. So we're making mistakes at the same rate, we're just catching them quicker with C++ because it gives us those additional tools of uh, stronger type checking. Now. C certainly has adopted some of that as well. Um, when it back the last time I was doing C, they didn't have like strong function prototypes. Was not something that was universally deployed yet. Uh, they didn't get that till C ninety nine. But um, so you can do these things uh, in C with enough self uh, 
discipline. I've just found that it's unreliable to count on everyone having the same high level of self-discipline. It's not to say that they're bad developers or anything, not saying that at all. I'm saying we're all weak human beings with flaws and we make mistakes. And the more we can get the tools to find those mistakes early, then the, be the better off we are. That's just, that's how I look at things. Um, there are a lot of people I know that really like C and they hate C++. And that's fine. You know, they have the personal discipline and intensity to achieve the same thing in C that I achieve in C++. Um, but, and I've, as I said, I've, I've programmed in C for many years. And so I've done that. Uh, I just find myself more productive with C++. So it's just, just how it goes. Uh, any other questions before we wrap this up? Okay, that'll be all then.